and we're going to we're going to start out with the three of the, these three folks, uh, each spending about three or four minutes talking about where they see the party going here in Illinois and maybe nationally. That's up to them. And then we'll open up to questions. I have. Uh, lots of questions from a lot of different people that I think will stimulate some good conversation. Uh, Pat Brady, you all know, former party chairman, uh, head of uh, Next Generation Strategies, uh, very active here in, in, in Illinois government and real Republican politics. Krista McCreary from the Chicago Tribune. And Dan Proft, also very active in campaigns and politics and has his own radio show, 560 AM. And Dan, believe it or not, I have 560 in my on my car you may not believe that we appreciate that okay Thank you, you and joe walsh i listen yeah. to so i i do I'm just speaking I do. for myself i do <laughs> well i didn't i missed it i'm so i'm just speaking for myself <laughs> uh, my show I, I i do enjoy it i also uh wanted to just say on, on behalf of myself i'm joined with a few of my friends and colleagues i work with uh law office Moni silverman and cross and some of those guys are here and also culliton strategies and some folks there are from here, so I appreciate that, them being there and supportive of letting me be part of that. So let's start off, Dan, why don't we just start out at, at the right, and you uh, tell us a little bit about where you see, you know, where we're going as a party, both here and, and perhaps nationally, if you think that's appropriate. We'll let you start. Well, I mean, I think it's difficult to say what the way forward is, is if you don't recognize how we got to this place. So where are we at as we sit here today? We're at a place where Democrats have more seats in the Illinois General Assembly since before the advent of the Republican Party where they were combating Whigs. <laughs> so that's a problem. In addition, historic losses in Lake County at the local level, in DuPage County, in Will County. So you have to take some stock and this is not a one election cycle problem. This just didn't start in the last two years, the last four years, as I've been sort of arguing to limited avail for the last 25 since I've been in this racket. Um, my one sentence summation on the 2018 election cycle at the state and local level, one sentence, sum up 25 years. Jim Edgar was J.B. Pritzker's debate prep partner and Bob Kustra endorsed Sean Caston for Congress. And I could actually take that statement and probably pull it back another 25 years. If you want an insight into what has been the problem with the Republican Party at the local level and why we find ourselves in a position where we're grasping for an organizational ethos and a policy agenda. I'll just add one more thing and then turn it over. There are some bright spots. There is something happening in this state that does provide opportunity. And we've seen it because other states that are much further along this path of opportunity found success this cycle. Doug Ducey, the governor of Arizona, winning in a walk despite losing that Senate seat. And uh, both Ron DeSantis and Rick Scott winning in Florida. School choice, 400,000 kids in Arizona, uh, excuse me, 400,000 kids in Florida, 260,000 kids in Arizona, mostly minorities. 44% of the Latino vote for Ducey in Arizona, 44% of the Latino vote for DeSantis in Florida. He also got 14% of the black vote, which is about a four point increase over Rick Scott from four years earlier. We have this Opportunity Scholarship Program that is in its infancy. We're only at about 6,000 scholarships now. But when we get to those numbers, and I think we're gonna get there, changing the trajectory and the opportunity for minority families in big urban centers and mid-sized ones across the state, that is a massive opportunity to reshape the governing and electoral coalition of the Republican Party that we should take advantage of. And the other two, and I don't want to filibuster here, so I'll just tick them off. The Janus decision will change the landscape in Illinois. It's going to reduce the power of the public sector unions. It's not going to be overnight. It's not going to be by 2020. It's not going to be cataclysmic. But over time, it changes the landscape. And the last opportunity we have that we didn't consummate this time, but we could, is middle income, blue collar tradespeople who we have not made a proper and consistent overture to, 
But when it's been done in other Midwestern states similarly situated, they've come over to the Republican Party in key elections and they could do the same here. So those three coalition partners, I think, have, provide at least some prospects for hope. Kristen? Uh, so when I first moved to Chicago and was working for a suburban newspaper, I was covering little communities. And I would often, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday nights, be sitting at a village board meeting out in the suburbs somewhere. And there was always, hopefully, maybe one person on that village board who was swimming against the current, who was voting against budgets. Um, maybe, that, maybe at the end of the day, the vote was four to one, and that person was always on the losing side. But I always viewed that person as such an important contrarian voice in government. And I sort of view the Republican Party as, as small as it is getting now and as little representation as they will actually have in Springfield as still a small but mighty voice that taxpayers need to offer a contrarian view even in these times. This election cycle does not mean that the House and Senate caucuses should sit down and be feeble and weak and nervous about the next election cycle. This means this is a time to stand up and be firm. And even if you are that five to one person at the village board meeting in New Lenox or one of the towns I was covering, that you're still there playing that role. It's really important. Um, just three policy issues that are going to come up. Dan mentioned opportunity scholarships. Um, the incoming governor-elect has said he will immediately try to dismantle that program. Those are his words. He had staff from the Illinois Education Association assisting his campaign. They are going to be um, pressuring him to start taking apart what was a glimmer of hope for low-income kids. So like Dan said, if the Republican Party wants to build that constituency and the party doesn't already have an organizing effort underway to connect with those parents at those schools, you're already behind. I'm going to a high school tomorrow where 31 kids are enrolled in the program, 330 are on the waiting list. And these parents are all minorities in a low-income community, they can't leave, and they're scared about losing that program. That should be number one for Republicans to make a difference in Springfield. Number two, that graduate income tax is going to be on the ballot, it's coming. Um, if the I don't see the Republican Party being able to push its own agenda, the turnaround agenda, right to work zones, all of that stuff is now, in my mind, back burner. But what the party can do is try to put pressure on some of these proposals to make them better. That graduate income tax, if it's going to be on the ballot, there should be an effort underway right now to try to unlock the pension clause as well. That is something the Republican Party should be working on, should be working across the aisle on, building um, support for that. And that, that is something that I think is a reasonable, a reasonable ask, especially if you've seen what Arizona has been doing. It is possible. And it's especially possible if that becomes a pressure point for the incoming Chicago mayor, for the governor, for the incoming Cook County board president. We know all the mayors across the state are asking for some sort of relief. If there was a unified effort, I could see something like that actually happening. That would be good for the Republican Party. And third, um, the governor has said many legislators I interviewed throughout the process um, of this last cycle are in support of recreational marijuana use. That is probably going to happen. The Republican Party can play an important role, again, smaller voice, in making sure that all the checks and balances are in place when that does get rolled out and that that revenue does not get dumped into the general revenue fund and frittered away, that if we're going to approve a new revenue source for the state, and that's the primary reason we're doing, that that money gets directly tied to paying down debt, paying down bills, and like I said, does not just turn into a new pot of money for the Democrats to dip into and start dishing out to their favorite pet programs and organizations. I'll move on to Pat, but I'll just say, Going forward, watching these two sides and all the different division in the Republican Party over the past few years especially, I think they both have played a very valuable role. But there has to be a focus now on not moderating positions, nobody has to move to the center, but there needs to be a focus continually on not the differences between the two sides of the Republican Party or th three sides or four sides, but the differences between the Republicans and the Democrats. And any time you feel that there is, a, there, we're slipping into this you know, cycle, this wheelhouse of beating up other Republicans, the focus needs to be continually shifted on the real problem in the state, which is one party control, which is the Democrats. And I think both sides of the party can unify around that. Pat Brady. I'll give everybody their money back, because I agree with everything that both they said. <laughs> so there's not going to be a disagreement on, on policy issues. But I do want to do one thing. 
quickly, I want to recognize my four kids that are here, uh, Maeve, Kelly, Patrick, and Grace. Uh, all been walking precincts since they were uh, children. And the one bright spot, I have to say, uh, Patrick is a uh, freshman at New York University, which is about as far left as you can go before the rubber band breaks. And a conservative Republican who celebrated Ronald Reagan's birthday his entire life got elected to the NYU Student Council. So there is hope. We've got a beachhead in Manhattan right now. I know, I know their mom is with them today, and I'm, I'm very proud of all of them, but I agree completely with what the, these two just said. There is room for everybody in, in the Republican Party, and that's the only approach we can take. It can't be too far right, it can't be too far left, but we got to include uh, everyone, and, and we can do that. But even if we include Dan and Pat and Kristen and Jeannie Ives and everybody else that might have a different viewpoint of what the Republican Party needs to be, even if we do that, we don't win. We don't have the numbers in this state of Republicans. We need to do all of that and then have candidates and talk about these, these are great issues that we can take and be relatable, and we need to have a suburban agenda. These issues are perfect for the city and the suburbs, but we need to have candidates that are relatable to people and can articulate that message and get elected. So there's, I think there's very little disagreement on, on policy necessarily. Now we did it here, and I said this in May, we did it in 2010. In 2010, I think, is a great example where everybody's on the same page. Mark Kirk, certainly not a conservative Republican, but a fiscal conservative, won. Beat Alexi Giannoulis in a very tough race. Bill Brady, who's about as, Bill's a lifelong friend, he's probably the most conservative person I know in Springfield, almost won the governor's mansion. Tom Hump picked up nine seats in the House, five, excuse me, five in the Senate, picked up county board races up and down the state, pretty much what the Democrats did thus in the last election cycle. But the difference there was we were all unified. We were all pulling the same way. We we're all pulling the same direction. We didn't have the infighting. We can win if we're unified. And if, if you want to, Dan gave a couple examples I agree with in Arizona and in Florida, but I think even a, a more relevant example is what Larry Hogan did in Maryland and what Charlie Baker did in Massachusetts, which are states more like Illinois than Florida or Arizona are, and particularly Larry Hogan. Larry Hogan ran as uh, a guy that could, was Maryland first, and he did a ton of things. And I'm not saying this is a right-left argument because the, the center can irritate the right as much as the right can irritate the center, but Larry Hogan pretty much alienated the entire Republican establishment in Maryland by some of the things he did, which would have made, Jeannie, would have made your head explode more than once, what the, some, some of the things that Larry Hogan did. But what the party did and the people in that state did they knew they were going to get 80% of what they wanted, so they got behind him. But he also did another thing, which I think negates the Trump drag. He said his whole philosophy is Maryland first. That, that kind of eliminates the national drag that we saw, in the, in the, uh, particularly in DuPage County. So there are ways we can do this, but we can't do it if we're fighting. We should probably stop now. <laughs> One of the things that, and you guys have all three alluded to this, and I think to me it's, 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 you're going down the right path, but one of the things that we've done as a party over the last few years, I was part of it, but it's escalated in the last four to five years, and I think primarily because of the money involved and because of the governor, but this continuous barrage on Speaker Madigan, of attacking Speaker Madigan constantly, um, and almost in some ways, to me, it's got to the point really of overboard, and I'm not, I, I guess I, my sense was that's not a message. And what you're talking about is, is going down a different road. And so I guess my question to all three of you is, what did we learn from that? Um, was it effective? What did it, how did it impact either party, uh, good or bad? And is that something that we ought to kind of leave to the side and start focusing on things like you've talked about where we can come together, whether it's, you know, Dan, you've done some, I think, some good things in property tax and talking about that, talked about schools, uh, we've talked about taxes, et cetera. So, Pat, you want to start out with the, and yeah, you and I have been uh, part of that. Uh, let, me, let me take a step back from that, though. And the one thing that's scary, and I, want, I do want to focus on the Democrats, and the one thing that was particularly scary to me nationally is the Democrats finally figured out that getting in the dirt with Trump doesn't work. It doesn't move their agenda forward. They actually came up with issues. They came up with the health care issue, which was a big fat lie. Every Republican supported keeping pre-existing conditions in any national health care bill. And then they went on the taxes, which was another big fat lie. But the point is, at least the Democrats figured out they have a message to run on, and it worked where I live, out in the suburbs, it was very effective. In, insofar as going after Speaker Madigan as one of the architects of Fire Madigan, which I was much ridiculed for, probably deservedly, 
The point with exposing um, Speaker Madigan, and it was just that, that when I was party chairman in 09, I think by, he had about a 20% name ID. And my objective was, and I think that, that the people that came after me followed it, including Governor Rauner, was we need to expose what goes on in Springfield. Because if you're down in Springfield, like Dan and Chris and I have been for a long, long time, and you see how it actually works, I think most people would kind of be taken aback that there is that much power consolidated in one person in this state and see how that power is used. And believe me, it's not a good government policy decision ever. It's all about pure power politics, which I was told by many people, some of whom are in this room, about what he's all about. It's maintaining power. So the attack, yeah, if he's at an 18% approval rate, and I say you keep it up, it didn't work this cycle because we had other headwinds. Kristen? I, I, would, I would generally agree with that. Um, what I've noticed over the years is um, in Chicago and the Collar Counties, maybe that Fire Madigan message wasn't all that effective. Um, but I agree that there were too many things. This, this was not an election of people saying yes to Mike Madigan. This was Trump being on the ticket and the Democratic Party being very well funded and a lot of these suburban candidates getting on TV. That's why he won a lot of seats. Um, the Fire Mike Madigan idea pushing accountability in Springfield has been very effective outside of the Chicago region. I mean, there was not, you know, there was always this downstate and there still is anti-Chicago sentiment among um, people downstate, Democrats and Republicans. But what that campaign did is really um, draw more attention of people connecting the dots. And I hear it a lot um, from candidates downstate and that's where you see Republicans doing well. So I do think it was effective um, in that regard. Dan? So um, I, I, I think we can walk and chew gum at the same time, so I don't think you have to let up on Madigan and holding him accountable for the, um, the plurality of destruction that has been visited upon this state's economy. However, um, I've been <laughs> saying this for years around the state, it's a very odd way to define yourself. And you know, sometimes you have to think about how we communicate in terms of like actual interpersonal communication rather than political communication. We're too clever for our own good. So when somebody asks you what you do for a living, you don't say, I'm not a drug dealer. You say, I am a radio talk show host or a columnist or a lobbyist or whatever. And when somebody asks us who we are as a Republican Party, we say we're not Mike Madigan. It's an odd way to define yourself. So yes, you can attack him and should attack him. And I, attack, I used him uh, in uh, ads that I ran this cycle in addition to other topics, but not exclusively. It's the exclusivity that's the problem. Oh, and by the way, if we're being honest, the misapplication. When you run a campaign that says Jeannie Ives is Mike Madigan's favorite Republican, you start to dilute the uh, credibility of that attack. So, um, so you have to be judicious and focused and uh, textured with respect to Madigan. The idea that this is all going to rise or fall on us connecting the dots for every suburban family that voting for Deb Conroy in Villa Park or Tara Costa Howard in Glen Ellen is the same thing as voting for Mike Madigan is a losing proposition which we have been prosecuting for since I worked for Lee Daniels in 1995. So there has to be more. There has to be more and there and you can run parallel tracks. Thank you. Let me along those same lines. Can I just say one more thing about messaging? Yeah, yeah, please. So just I just think this is interesting. So I had this conversation with Shelby Steele on our show uh, on Friday and one of the great things about having a radio show is you get to talk to people a lot smarter than you like the brilliant Shelby Steele, South Side a Chicago guy. And he helped crystallize this for me. How we're delivering, it's not just us in Illinois generally, but maybe here specifically. How we're delivering the wrong message to the wrong constituents. So the bl black community, for example, they're beyond the civil rights era idealism. They're looking for pragmatic solutions to quality of schools they don't have access to, to money in their uh, bank account, to opportunity for themselves and their kids. And what are we delivering? We're delivering kind of the, we're not racist, we see your point about Black Lives Matter, kind of uh, a par a parroting what the left is doing. In other words, we're trying to make some kind of half-ass idyllic argument to people looking for pragmatic solutions. Meanwhile, in the suburbs, we're arguing about, or we're offering up sort of like 
fiscal conservatism on the margins. Uh, and I'm the first one to admit it, hard cap on property taxes or opposition to a graduate state income tax. And we've got it reversed. Um, to borrow from James Earl Jones in Field of Dreams, they have money, it's peace they lack. They're looking to be inspired by something bigger than themselves and we're feeding them dollars and cents. And over here, this constituency is looking for dollars and cents and we're trying to kind of do uh, Al Sharpton pantomime. Neither works to these constituents. And we should think about how we're messaging to these constituents that we want to sort of um, re have reimagine who the Republican Party is. There's a, um, an argument, that, and we have different philosophies and different views on what the messaging should be. And the Democrats do their messaging, but what they seem to do better, and maybe you, you may have a different view, and, and I'm certainly open to that, obviously. But in terms of just the basic fundamentals, of getting the vote out, of identifying voters, of absentee balloting, walking precincts, strong township organizations, seat organizations, they seem to do the fundamentals and basics better than we do. And what, where can we improve on that if you agree with that premise? And what, is that a component of what we need to do short and long term to be successful as a party going forward? Pat? Sure. We, in 2010, we beat them. In 2014, we beat them at both those. But in 16, um, uh, excuse me, in 18, we didn't. We didn't have an effective early vote program. We didn't in 12. Bob Dole lost, and I'll take responsibility for it, up in 10, because we did not give him a good enough uh, early and absentee vote program. The, the blocking and tackling, listen, I'm not using this as an excuse at all. But they had $171 million to play with. They had gold-plated everything. It was like something none of us have ever seen. But the reality is we have to face in 2020, I mean, that's what we're up, that's what we're up against. So we've got to figure out all the things we're talking about here. We've got to get going right away and figure out how we're going to attack this. Because um, you know, I don't know how you spend $171 million for a $200,000 a year job and you get to move to Springfield. But I mean, that's what he's prepared to do, obviously. And money is just no object. So that's going to be a consideration that we're going to have to take in, uh, to, into account. Kristen? I, I've always wondered this. I mean, I live in the city, so I really only see the Democratic operation um, at its core. And I see people being driven to the polls and just a very um, but block by block technique of getting people to vote. And so I don't have a good answer for that. Maybe Dan does, um, having more of an on, on the ground experience with some of these campaigns. But I don't know what the Republican Party, in terms of that, uh, without the resources that the Democrats had this time around, could do better. No, I mean, there's, there's definitely a resource disadvantage. There's just a, a philosophical disadvantage that leads resources to accrue in one party and less so in the other, like, you know, government jobs, for example, uh, and mo mo most importantly, government pensions, for example. Um, so that puts us at a disadvantage. But I, I still say that the fundamental problem is, um, well, courage with a point. So I was just on a call for Salem Radio before this luncheon with like, you know, Medved and Hewitt and other hosts for Salem Station. And we were talking about how Orange County has gone blue for the first time in history. All the uh, Republican congressmen got swept out of Orange County. And one of the guys, uh, Lanny Chen, who's a Stanford academic, said, look, um, I mean, see if this uh, rings eerily familiar. We have no infrastructure in California. The legislative leaders have been just trying to stave off super minority status. And they were able to do that for a couple of years, but they weren't building anything. They weren't recruiting anybody. They weren't developing talent. And so ultimately it just took, you know, something worse than your normal midterm election for all of those Orange County Republicans to be swept out. And that's what happened. Can I add something on that too? And I, and I agree with you. They, they didn't. But what they did, and I think we can do differently, and I think we can take a big lesson from California, because I was on the National Committee when California, we kind of started, I remember, remember we had Ronald Reagan and Pete Wilson come out of California. I mean, we had a lot of, it was a good, and particularly Orange County. But what they did is, and what we got to avoid doing here, and that's why my initial comment where there's room for everybody, if we take a dive one way or another and focus on the middle or the, or the right, and we're not unified, they just... That party consciously, and I'm not saying this critically of the right, I'm just saying that that's what that party chose to do, which did not allow them in a state like California to build an infrastructure. They simply could not raise money out there. Yeah, well, I mean, but here's the thing. So here's where Pat and I apparently disagree a, a bit. I don't think it's a right-left issue or, or a conservative-moderate issue. Not nearly as much as it's an outside-inside issue. 
And uh, I, I think you know him too, Jeff Carter, who is a Hyde Park Angels co-founder. He uh, writes for this blog called Points and Figures. Excellent piece last week on how Chicago lost Amazon HQ2. And one of the points that he makes is, look at the names that were charged with putting together the proposals for HQ2. It's the same 600 names in Chicago and Chicago Metro that you see all the time. And they're all interconnected. And nobody gets in. Same people doing the same things. Why do C-suite executives support Democrats here, where successful businessmen in Indiana support Republicans? Because they're in control of elite institutions. They want stability. No one, the Republican victories, they care less. It's about the same people on the inside maintaining their seats on the inside. And for too long, the Republican Party has occupied a little corner in that closed network. And those handful of Republicans in that corner in that network were satisfied with selling out the rest of the party to be in the network. Okay. So until you open the network and really truly be open to talent, however it presents itself from wherever it comes, then you're going to have a problem. And that's not a moderate conservative dichotomy because I've supported moderates and conservatives, certainly moderates on issues where I'm conservative, as so have you, Pat. It's an inside-outside problem. Let me add some of that to, I'm sorry, Chris, that we, we probably agree on. Don't you think we have an opportunity now in this mayoral race with everybody besides you and I not filing to run for Chicago mayor today, that we wait 13 to 18 percent in the city, Republican vote, where you, that business agenda that we all agree on, or it's a part of the Republican platform, if we got organized in Chicago, and, I'm, and if the organization is there and actually stayed together, we might have, you know, 10, 8 or 9 percent is a big chunk of what's going to win the mayoral race. I think that's an opportunity for us to reassert ourselves in a real downtime. I agree. I mean, I, look, I, when we were last here, I said, I said, one of the shames is that in this Wild West race, Chicago mayor, where what was the poll out today? Prankle goes at 15 and Mendoza's at 13 and then 11, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Um, a Republican candidate. As Pat's just saying, the Republican percentage of the vote here, somebody compelling, interesting, even if they couldn't win a runoff, they could get to it. Even if they couldn't get to a runoff, they establish a beachhead in Chicago and start to change the conversation in the state. So it's another failure of the Republican Party, if we're being honest with ourselves. It's a failure of the Republican Party to not be in a position to elevate somebody in this mayor's race with this historic opportunity of the open seat, which, you know, the closed network doesn't allow for very well, often. Well, beyond the, 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 the alleged the lack of failure, and isn't this too, though, an opportunity, even if you don't have a candidate, you can have a voice. And this is the Republican, and these people, yeah. they, they need to come before the Republicans and say, hey, if you want our 9% or whatever we can deliver, this is what we demand. And, you know, a sugar tax is a bad idea. A 10% sales tax is a bad idea. I mean, this is tax haven here. And the two people in that poll you mentioned today, they're leading candidates. I mean, I don't think they could, there's, they're going to be taxing the air. I mean, there's nothing those two wouldn't tax. So I think we have an opportunity as Republicans, even without a candidate, to assert right. ourselves in a positive way. So, so two questions along those lines. Gov given the fact that Governor Rauner I, I, may or may not be involved going forward, let, let's assume he's not, how do we compete financially uh, given what's going on on the other side? And two, and to Dan, you brought it up a minute ago, how do you get the business community, not individual donors, one or two big name donors, um, and we, we have them and we've benefited from them, but how do we get the business community, not only in the city, but around the state, to be engaged and supportive of Republican candidates, given some of the issues that are going to come up in the next General Assembly anticipated. Pat, why don't you start? Yeah, fundraising is a good time. Um, it's, 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 it's going to be rough for us uh, to raise money because a lot of the donors, and it's not just what happened in Illinois, because there are, believe it or not, as Dan mentioned, there are some bright spots and there are some good young leaders and some things that actually happened that were, were, were positive. But I tell you what, and a lot of people in this room aren't going to like this, I'm not saying this is a never Trump statement, what's killing us with the major donors, and a real good friend of mine is one of our major donors, is Donald Trump. They do not like the rhetoric and the behavior coming out of the White House. And they do not want to write checks for a party that doesn't stand up to that. I'm not saying that as any commentary other than what I have been told by donors. So we have an, an uphill climb. But you know, we probably need to get a little more innovative too. I mean, what did the Democrats have? This act blue, all these, all these things that were very innovative. All these kids are given money. You know, they go on their app or whatever. And we need to step that up a, a, a lot. And there are many things we can do, but it is going to be in the short term 
um, very difficult. That's why I think, and I think the leadership's already talking about doing this, we need to coalesce around some issues where we can have influence, and then go back to donors and say, this is what we're doing for you. Kristen? I don't fundraise, so I don't have a good, um, obviously, you know that, right? Um, you you might need to for the <laughs> I know. publishing. Right. I'll fundraise for John Cass, keep him employed. All right, um, I'll donate. But I'll tell. I mean, there is there is a there is a frustration in the business community out there. Even though they play the inside game, and even though they hire the tax attorneys in order to get their taxes reduced, um, there is a frustration that could be tapped in there, where I could see um, them taking a more less pocketbook but more principled stance. But the other issue is they're leaving. A lot of my conversations with the with business owners who probably would have um, been aligned with the views of the Republican Party. They're, they're in Indiana now. They're, they're done. They got tired of, of playing all the games. So um, that's, there is a frustration there with the remaining business community that's here. The Republican Party could be pushing a, a better policy agenda or reaching out to them. But again, I don't raise money. I just well, work. I mean, I infrastructure building is, infrastructure building is not, you know, it's not pretty. It's, and I think there's a couple things. One, look. You have got to be a courageous party. You've got to stand for things that are important and be willing to run into panzer fire in support of those things. You have to inspire people that a new day is dawned, that you have received the unmistakable message that has been sent oh, this cycle and in many previous cycles, and that you are going to make a qualitative change, and you're going to be a party that is going to spoil for these important fights that impact our quality of life. People don't believe that. You could, you know, curse me all you want. It's obvious people do not believe we are that party. So I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news and obvious news. Number, that's number one. Number two is there's a, a whole set of entrepreneurial owner operators of businesses. This is the painstaking stuff. And all of us get lazy, myself included, when you have billionaires come over the top and you know, kind of take most of your fundraising concerns away until the other side comes up with a guy who's got more money over the top. And then you're in a bit of a pickle. Um, so the point is to say, the point is to say that it's not a one-person job. It's not this, just the state party chairman job. It's not just the House or Senate caucus leaders' jobs. It's and it's not just my job either. It's it's everybody's job to sort of leverage your professional networks to give some consideration to dipping your toe in the water. You know, it starts out with a $500 donation, a $100 donation, and you know, for people that have means, you build up over time, and pe these become your bedrock donors. And you can raise a lot of money in, a, in small amounts if you've got house files of 25 and 50 and 100,000 consistent donors, which there's no reason the Republican Party in a state of 13 million people shouldn't have. But it takes concerted effort, it takes stick to it it takes grinding it out, and that's, those are things that we haven't done in a long time. I 100% agree on that. So as we, as we think about going forward, we've talked about messaging, we've talked about money, we've talked about um, fundamentals, and given we have kind of two sides in a party, and, and I suspect that goes on in every state, what, what does the ideal candidate look like for, for either one of you guys, the three of you, that can um, maybe coalesce around the issues you've talked about? I'm sure we're missing a couple, but let's just assume those are the issues. What's the ideal candidate look like that can get elected? And, and I think primarily we've maybe said the Chicago suburban area is tougher for us than downstate. We've had some success, good success downstate. But what do we need to be looking for in finding candidates who want to run and they could get elected. I think one of the best candidates I've ever seen and traveled with her and was with her from the beginning was Erica Harold, our Attorney General nominee, who ran into a Democratic buzzsaw. I mean, she's as conservative as anybody would want, but she's also as smart as anybody I've ever met and was an outstanding candidate. It's not just the fact that she was Harvard and Miss America and all those other things. She's fundamentally a very decent human being who wanted to be involved in public service and quite frankly just couldn't get the money to go into the, you know, the JB buzzsaw. But that type of, of candidate, somebody that's young, like Dan says, somebody that's inspiring, that has an inspiring life story, that's relatable, that can go into precincts that we need to go and win, that's not just white Irish males, I, I think that's the ideal candidate to me. And I, ho I hope and pray that uh, Erica 
stays involved in Republican politics because she, uh, if she would have won, she would have been the face of the party and would have been a great face. Kristen. I mean, just we look for candidates who are independent thinkers, who are not going down to Springfield to make friends, who are courageous, who will be that lone vote, who show up to committee meetings prepared, having done their homework, not coasting, asking tough questions. Um, I mean, that's what taxpayers deserve and, and who have ideas and who are willing to reach across the aisle and find common ground. I don't really think there's a really complicated puzzle to what makes a good candidate. What makes a good candidate is what makes a good public servant. And I think you can find that on both sides of the aisle, but in particular in this state, we are looking for Republicans too who will go down and be courageous. And there's, there are kind of few and far between, to be honest. Yeah, I don't think it's a, a profile like the identity politics of the left. I despise that. It's uh, divisive. It's ignorant, it's anti-reason, it's anti-intellectual. I'm not, I'm not gonna play that game. I'm gonna play the game about qualities. So, I mean, just like if you watch Britain's Got Talent or American Idol or whatever, um, there's a lot of people who can sing and they have a lot of different styles. So cast a wide net and see who can sing. And it may not be exactly your style, but it's something where you recognize this is somebody who has something to say, wants to do something important, and has the talent to do it. And the, and the other quality, in addition to courage, which is the f most fundamental quality any human being can possess, the formation of every virtue at its testing point. If you do not have courage, you cannot have any other virtue you say you have because you will wilt when tested. C.S. Lewis. Be prolific. We need content producers. We need incubators of ideas. We need people that are not looking to not take positions, but are looking to make arguments, to educate within their social circles, within their communities, and ultimately within their districts. This is not wait for Labor Day and send, see if you can send out the most mail pieces with the most bullet points about how you're a pillar of the community and how you oppose taxes and are for safety and you're for everything that's good and oppose everything that's bad. This is about making arguments over the long term so you actually bring people along with you so that the things you wish were true, like the Tribune editorial board wishes it were true, that uh, unfunded pension liabilities inflame the passions of the masses. I do too, it doesn't. We haven't made the arguments. Same I'm not thing. done. I'm not, I haven't quit. Well, right, I'm sure. <laughs> Same. I'm working on a pension piece today, and it's going to be a Pulitzer, and it's going to change the landscape of Chicago, yeah. I promise. <laughs> it's only my 200th, only my 200th, and we have a, we have a philosophy. It takes a thousand editorials to move a, p a position, so I have a little ways to go. Yeah. That Mary Schmeek uh, wrote a thousand editorials about cats. That's how she won her Pulitzer. Uh, <laughs> Right? Right? No. Right? No. Oh no, that's a cheap shot. They can't. They can't agree with me. Um, but, but, but I mean, you, making arguments. I wish. I, I can't believe everybody doesn't understand how they're being pummeled by the highest property taxes in the nation, in this state. How their wealth is being destroyed. How their home is being liquidated. I can't believe people don't understand it. And guess what? A lot of people don't understand it. So it takes relentless making the argument, providing data, turning people onto information. And we need candidates that are interested in that, not just who want to wear a sash and look pretty doing it. I think one of the struggles that a lot of folks have is, and, and Dan, I, I actually agree with a lot of what you said and agree with a lot of what went on, said for so all of shocked. you, but how do, we, how do we have those conversations and find those candidates and not whether you're on, and I don't want to do this, I want to be very careful, I say this, not whether it's on Pat, you're on Pat's side or Dan's side. How do we not destroy each other, and how do we find those types of candidates that are electable in the general election that we can all rally behind? And, I, and that's not, I, there's no editorial comment well, in that. I just I mean, want to ask it, for, for both of you, all three of you. Well, I mean, I, I'll take it first. I mean, um, like you said, cast a wide nut, and then know, and let the, have, those, have those candidates' backs when they go to, Run. I mean, look, I'll, let me tell, I'll tell you something I haven't said publicly. Um, I looked at these races that we supported, the legislative races that my little group supported, uh, pre-Labor Day. And the numbers I saw come from, coming from suburban races, mm -hmm. I had a conversation internally with our group, should we sit this election out? Because they were that bad. 
So we could sit this election out. We're not leadership. We have no moral responsibility to participate in this election. We can make the case that this is going to be brutal and let's stand clear of it. And we didn't do that uh, because one, you know, we thought there's a path in some of these. Two, we've got too many people that we've supported previously or want to support currently who are good candidates who we need in the General Assembly and who are relying on us, at least in part. We in HRO supported some of the same candidates in some House races, in other cases we didn't, but who are relying on us to, in part. So we were there like they anticipated we would be and we said we would be even when we knew it was a steep incline. And so I think you have to Make sure you do your best to keep your promises to the talent that you recruit so even if they don't make it across the finish line the first time, they come back and try the race again a second time because there's a whole host of people in Springfield and at every level of office that uh, don't have a clean one loss record. They lost the first time out or first couple times out and then they won. And so we need that talent to want to come back to the party even if the first time out it's not successful. Pat. Uh, I, I agree with that, right? There's, a, there's another probably bigger problem that we have in, in recruiting um, in that there are a lot of young people, a lot of people of color, a lot of people that don't necessarily see the Republican Party as a place to go. When you've got a president of the United States that's calling Hispanics rapists and murderers, when he's denigrating women, and denigrating, de well, let me finish. I'm just telling you, I'm, this is a political science discussion, not an emotional one. I, I, you can have your never Trump stuff or pro Trump, but the, the reality is, we do have a problem at that level in recruiting because a lot of people, a lot of people we need to attract to have relatable messengers don't want to line up with the Republican parties because some of the positions that have been taken both locally and nationally. And we need to, 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 to face that fact. We got to remember that we're not in Alabama, we're in Illinois. And if we want to make the tent bigger, we need to, to make that tent bigger. By, and I agree with Dan, throw that broad net out there. But we've got to understand that we've got to have some convincing to do with some young people and others that we're a party where you want to be. And I agree also with Dan on the message of when, when I came, we've been involved in politics since I was a little kid, but in 1980 when I had my first vote for Ronald Reagan, that was, that was inspiring. His message was uplifting. It was about the country recovering. It was about the strength of America, that shining city on a hill. And that's not what we get out of Washington, D.C. right now. And whether you like to believe it or not, it's actually hurting Republicans all over the country. And we have to come up with an Illinois strategy that bifurcates us away from the president's message. And we're not going to be able to recruit people that Dan's talked about we need to win. Well, I mean, but, but I mean, just one thing at the local level, I mean, we should have this is the infrastructure building piece of it, have credible messengers. I mean, we should exist uh, irrespective of who is in the White House for any given four-year period. We should exist and be robust and be competitive, if not vict victorious, regardless of who's in the White House, regardless of who's saying what. I mean, we've got some messengers uh, that, were, that were congressional candidates, for goodness sakes, this time around. That certainly didn't help the brand of the Republican Party either, because we got people asleep at the switch. So we got to get better. I mean, wait, we got to be more competent. We got to be more aggressive. We got to be more more thoughtful. Uh, we got to be better. Can we be a party? You know, let me let me say that. And I, we got about this, three I minutes, and I got one more question. Say, I agree with that too. But and I agree with the better. We got to. But look, let's talk about things that, that beyond just a big word of better. We got to come up with yeah. uh, uh, things that are more practical. We all want to be better. We can all be better. Certainly, we can do better. But what does better mean? And that's the discussion we need to have right now. And I think there are a lot of smart people talking about this to make sure that the Republican Party in this state is relevant. Is there a way that given all of this conversation and given the state of where we are that we can find these candidates with the wide net and avoid the divisive, expensive, nasty primaries that we've gone through over the last, like maybe for a long, long time, but it seems to be a uh -oh, problem Jeannie for us. Jeannie is shaking her head at me. <laughs> No, I, it's it's. Now here's the answer. Listen, yeah, I answer. Say this. It's a fair I, I'm going to answer this. Here's the deal. And I was thinking more. We, we, we there was there was 20 million dollars spent in in the primaries, Republican primaries last time. And I'm not aiming this at all at Jeannie. Jeannie, I ran to Jeannie. I'm not. I know. I ran into Jeannie about two months after the uh, election. Literally walking out of the elevator, gave her a big hug. I said, Jeannie, there's some issues we're never going to agree on. But you know what? We're on the same team. Right. But the point is, some of these primaries, and I'm sorry, Dan, but some of these primaries were just. I mean, throwing a million and a half at Durkin with Mickey Straub was just a waste of money. That money could have gone to Erica Harold. And I'm not, I'm not anti-primary, but if you're going to do it, let's be smart about it so the 
So at the end of the day, we end up winning the general election. My question was more in the context of legislative races, not, not yours. So, Dan, I'm sure you have a response to Pat. Are you done, Pat? <laughs> well, no, I wasn't. I wasn't. No, I wasn't. So, the metaphysical we got, we got one more minute, Dan. One minute. One minute, Dan. Um, philosophy is clear. Uh, it won't change. Uh, I believe that uh, competition produces better goods and services, and that includes political competition. So uh, the closed network problem does not get, and it is a problem, does not get solved by closing it further. So uh, the primaries are for improving the quality of the caucus, and generals are for growing the caucus. That's what we've said from the outset, and that's what we continue to say. And oh, by the way, to that point, no uh, incumbent that uh, I, in which I supported a primary opponent lost their general election. Thank you. So it's about, inc it's about improving the caucus and then growing the caucus in the general. And if people disagree with that, then they disagree with it. No, Kristen, it's, it's whoa, 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 no, 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 you got 30, I, 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 you got 10 seconds, seconds and then Kristen gets the final word. Here, here's the deal, and I, I don't disagree that the, the primaries can improve the candidates, but we can't spend $20 million in primaries, and I'm sorry, Dan, you're, and, and you're a friend, but your track record of putting candidates in there that actually flip seats, you've never flipped a seat. And that's the problem. We need to have that's, that discussion, not angrily, not true, but all the, the no. millions of tens of millions of dollars right. you've spent is never fun right. to see. Kristen, you get the last word, we're, and then we're done. Okay. I, I, <laughs> having experienced these candidates, and we do a lot of interviewing, so I know a lot of these candidates intimately that both establishment Republicans and conservative Republicans put up. And so I agree with both of them on a couple of points. Dan's group has moved the caucus more to a conservative fiscal sanity position. Um, a lot of the downstate Republicans who won primaries this time around and last time around are not going to be in Ask Me's pocket like many Republicans from some of these communities were for years and it was just accepted. Oh, this person is just gonna vote this way because they have such and such state workers in their district. I think we're kind of just down to maybe Sam McCann on that. Um, so, so that has been effective. The danger in doing that is what Pat is talking about. You expend a lot of resources to keep a Republican seat Republican and, and make a difference in making it more conservative, but there have been some big fat losers in terms of who, has, who is being challenged on that side. So again, I'll go back to and close with what I said initially. If these two sides can constantly focus on what the real opposition is, and that should be the Democrats. Look at what they've done to the state. You don't need me to go through all the numbers. It is a miserable place that has been run by a Democratic legislature since 2003. Pension holidays, lack of, a, lack of balanced state budgets, a bill backload that puts small business owners out of business, prorating money to school districts, borrowing to pay pension costs. I could go on and on. That should be the focus of every conversation that, that these two gentlemen have and that the party has going forward. Okay, folks, thank you very much. We'd like to thank all of our panelists.